My name is Emma. To me, my dad was everything. Only he and I worked together as a team. Dad has been a truck driver since my mother passed away when I was a little child, always putting in long hours to ensure we had enough. He would tell me over dinner every night how important it was to succeed in school and make a name for myself. Just enough money was saved by him to get me started at college. I saw Mark during the first week of classes at college, spilled his coffee all over his shirt after literally bumping into him. Watch it, he yelled initially, his eyes glimmering. Then when he looked closely at me, his features softened. I apologize, that was severe. Let's begin again. My name is Mark. I said, Emma, still feeling ashamed about the coffee. Really sorry about the shirt. It's only coffee. He smiled and waved it away, saying, no harm done. You hear the study what? My response was, financial analysis. He pointed to himself and smiled. The same thing here. It appears that we will be classmates. Mark had a quick wit and a fast smile, which made him endearing. We clicked right away. It was as effortless as stepping into a warm bath to spend time with him. We quickly became best friends, studying together, hanging out after courses, and getting late-night munchies at the 24-hour diner next to school. Then just when I believed that my life was finally improving, it fell apart. Dad passed away suddenly after a heart attack. I fell down once the rug was ripped out from under me. All we had was our flat. There were no savings. Money for college. Lost. My plans in my world are all in ruins. I couldn't find my way. Mark, however, intervened. A few weeks after the funeral, he dropped by one evening with a box of takeout and a six-pack from our favorite Chinese restaurant. There were Dad's old books and photos all about us as we sat on the shabby couch in my living room. What about moving in together? Mark said in a forceful tone. You know, reduce spending. We could figure things out. Uncertain of what to think, I gazed at the floor. Mark, I'm not sure. I'm hardly able to maintain this site. He responded, Listen, we get married and move in here together. You work for the time being, I'll continue to study, and then it's your turn. Then I'll be on our side. With sincere eyes, he made the proposal. There was a genuine ring to the notion, even though it seemed ridiculous. I nodded slowly, either due to the loss clouding my judgment or the frantic hope fluttering in my breast. All right, let's get started. However, assure me that it will be my time once you graduate. He responded, promise, and reached over to give me a squeeze. A handful of Mark's acquaintances saw our marriage ceremony, which took place at a courtroom two months later. Our small island in the storm was Dad's apartment. As I juggled two jobs to keep our heads above water, my days turned into nights. I sold sweets at a nearby bakery at night, and delivered coffee and dishes at a busy cafe during the day. My constant companion was exhaustion, but with Mark immersed in his textbooks and our debts mounting, I couldn't afford to stop. Mark spent a lot of time at home due to his study routine. That should have made things simpler, but it didn't. He became a bear due to the stress of his impending finals. He gets upset about the tiniest things, particularly when supper isn't ready when he expects it. My feet were sore from the long hours and my arms hurt, so one night I arrived home later than usual. With the exception of the bowl flickering over Mark's study table, the house was dark. I flinched at the sound and dropped my keys on the counter. Mark's head abruptly emerged from his books, his brows furrowed in frustration. Where have you been? I have been anticipating my meal. There's nothing ready, he said in a piercing voice, each word a stab. I leaned against the doorframe and sighed. Mark, I apologize. Today, the bakery was packed. 
I still haven't had a chance to remove my shoes. Well, I'm going hungry. I can't study if I'm not eating. His voice became a little softer, but the annoyance lingered between us like a dense mist. I said, I'll fix something quick, overcoming my exhaustion. I dug through the refrigerator, gathering what little we had to make toast and scrambled eggs. It wasn't really gourmet, but it was the best I could do at the moment. I was burdened by more than simply the strain of our living arrangement. Mark's parents, Richard and Marianne, were also present. They were both wealthy, intelligent, and articulate. They never missed an opportunity to tell me that I didn't exactly match their ideal son. Visiting them was an ordeal. Their old house was like a fortress of books and high culture, each room overflowing with literature and artifacts from their travels around the world. The first time I stepped into their living room, Marianne had eyed my secondhand jeans and faded college sweater before offering a thin-lipped smile. Emma, dear, have you read the latest by Jonathan Franzen? Oh, but of course, you've been too busy working your... How many jobs is it now? Her tone was honeyed poison. Richard was no better. It's a fascinating treatise on the sociopolitical landscape of contemporary America, but let's discuss something simpler. His chuckle was a soft knife, and I felt my cheeks burn with humiliation. I tried to hold my own, nod along, and throw in a comment here and there, but it was like shooting arrows in the dark. Eventually, I stopped trying. One evening, after a particularly grueling shift at the cafe, I mustered the courage to tell Mark how I felt. Your parents, they don't think I'm good enough for you, do they? I asked him as he clicked away on his laptop. Mark didn't look up. Look, they're my parents. They have their ways, but they mean well. You're overreacting. I knew then that arguing was pointless. He couldn't see, wouldn't see it. So I pulled back, retreating into my shell of work and solitude. Mark continued to visit his parents alone, often staying overnight. I wasn't invited, and I didn't ask to be. When Mark finally graduated and landed a decent job with a good salary, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. Now it was my turn, right? I remember asking him one evening as we sat down for a rare quiet dinner. Mark had just started talking about his new role at the company, buzzing with excitement over the projects he was handling. Yeah, about that, he said, his fork pausing midair. Look, Em, things are tight right now. The job pays well, but we've got bills, debts. You know how it is. I nodded, biting back my disappointment. I get that, but we talked about this, Mark. It's supposed to be my turn. I was thinking I could start with just a couple of classes. I'll keep working at the bakery to help out. He shook his head, a frown creasing his forehead. Emma, be realistic. We need every penny we can get. Forget about college for now. The resentment that had been simmering inside me boiled over. I supported you. I snapped. I worked two jobs, Mark, so you could have this. So we could have this. And now you're telling me to forget my dreams? He didn't look at me. It's not like that, and you know it. Things change. We need to be practical. Practical? The word hung in the air between us, heavy and cold. But before I could argue further, life threw us another curveball. I found out I was pregnant. All thoughts of school were pushed to the back burner as we prepared for our new arrival. Lily came into our lives like a storm, fierce and beautiful. I threw myself into motherhood with all I had, but the strain on our marriage didn't ease. If anything, it grew worse. Mark was distant, often coming home late. And when he was around, he critiqued my parenting. You need to push her more, Em. He'd say as he watched me play with Lily. She needs to start learning early. I signed her up for French lessons at a toddler developmental center. She's too young, Mark, I would protest, feeling the familiar flare of anger. 
she needs to play to be a kid. Mark had been sorting through some papers, not really listening. At that, he looked up, his expression hard. Maybe if you had some education, Emma, you'd understand the importance of what I'm doing for her. The words said a lot. They said I was just the uneducated wife, good enough to work and pay bills, but not good enough to be a real partner in raising our daughter. When Lily turned five, the gap between me and my family widened into a chasm. Mark's parents took it upon themselves to completely oversee her upbringing. They showed up at every school event, every concert, parading around as if they were the primary caregivers. Mark didn't just allow this, he encouraged it. It got to the point where he actually forbade me from attending school events. Emma, you don't have the education to understand what's going on there. It's best if you stay home, he said one evening, his tone final, leaving no room for argument. I felt my face flush with hurt and anger. So what? I'm not good enough to see my daughter perform. Is that what you're saying? Mark shrugged, indifferent. It's about what's best for Lily. My parents can provide the kind of support and image we need to project. You being there, it's just not right. I was stunned, words failing me, as the sting of rejection from my own husband sank in. This wasn't just about me anymore. It was about our daughter and the warped lessons she was learning about worth in family. Lily's behavior started changing, too. She no longer saw me as an authority figure, much less a mother. When I asked her to tidy her room or finish her vegetables, she'd scoff and say, Grandma says I don't have to listen to you. It broke my heart every single time. As Lily grew older, her disregard turned into embarrassment. One day, when Lily was about 13, she had friends over for a study group. I was vacuuming, lost in my thoughts about how distant our relationship had become. I turned the corner into the hallway, and there was Lily, her friends trailing behind her. Seeing me, she hesitated for just a second. Her eyes darted from me to her friends, and then, as if she'd made a decision, she said, Oh, that's just the housekeeper. The words hit me like a physical blow. I stood there, frozen, as her friends nodded casually and followed her into the room. As soon as I was sure they were out of earshot, I rushed to the bathroom, tears streaming down my face. How had it come to this? How had I become a stranger in my own daughter's eyes? That evening, after Lily's friends had left and we were alone in the kitchen, I confronted Mark. Did you know what Lily calls me in front of her friends? The housekeeper. That's what she thinks of me, thanks to you and your parents. Mark didn't even have the decency to look surprised. He just kept scrolling through his phone. Well, what did you expect, Emma? You set yourself up for that by never pushing back. If she doesn't respect you, it's because you never demanded it. I stared at him, the man I had married, the man I had supported through college, and didn't recognize him. He was a stranger one who valued appearances over family, image over substance. Turning 36 was supposed to be a fresh start, a chance to mend fences and rebuild the bridges. With that little hope, I booked a table at one of the nicer restaurants in town, a place where Mark and I once celebrated happier times. I even splurged on a new dress, something simple yet elegant, hoping to light up Mark's eyes like I used to. I came home that evening, the fabric of my new dress swishing softly against my legs, feeling a mix of nerves and excitement. Mark, Lily, hurry up and get ready. I booked us a table for my birthday. It's going to be special. I announced, trying to inject some cheer into my voice. Mark looked up from his laptop, his face blank, while Lily didn't even bother to pause her video game. Go out with you in that. Mark snorted first, and then Lily joined in, her laughter sharp and mocking. What's wrong? I frowned, looking down at my dress. You think you look good. You look like a scarecrow. 
Lily scoffed. I'm not going anywhere with you. You'll just embarrass us. Yeah, let's not pretend we're some happy family. You're just, you're just an ignorant loser, Emma. Mark's voice was cruel, devoid of any warmth. The room spun a little, their words hitting like physical blows. But I thought, I thought we could all have dinner together, like a family. I stammered, my voice barely above a whisper. A family with you. Mark laughed, cold and harsh. He thrust an envelope at me. Confused, I opened it slowly. It was a divorce application. This is my final gift to you, he said, his tone final. I stood there, the paper shaking in my hands. This wasn't happening. It couldn't be. We're moving out, Mom, to the nice part of town with Dad. There's no place for you there, Lily added, her voice echoing her father's disdain. You can keep this old place. They packed their bags that night. I watched, numb and broken, as they hauled their belongings out of the apartment. Mark didn't look back, his steps never faltering. Lily followed him, her eyes avoiding mine, as if I were a stranger. Not the mother who had cradled her, soothed her nightmares, and cheered for every little milestone. The door slammed shut, the sound echoing through the now empty apartment. I sank to the floor, my birthday dress crumpled beneath me. The divorce papers clutched in my fist. The tears came then, hot and unending, mourning not just the end of my marriage, but the loss of my daughter, my family, my whole world. The divorce was a brutal affair, stripped of any dignity or semblance of love. When Mark sued for sole custody of Lily, claiming, I was unfit due to my educational status and financial instability. The courtroom felt colder than any place I had ever been. Sitting there, the harsh lights of the courtroom felt like a spotlight, illuminating every failure I ever thought I had hidden. My in-laws were there, right beside Mark, united in their disdain for me. Richard, with his sharp suit and sharp tongue, didn't miss a chance to emphasize my inadequacies. She simply lacks the capabilities to provide Lily with the environment she needs. Richard testified, his voice smooth and confident. Her lack of education and refinement is, quite frankly, not up to the standard a child like Lily deserves. Moran nodded along, her agreement silent but palpable in the tight press of her lips. I wanted to scream, to tell them that love can't be measured in diplomas or bank statements but the words choked in my throat, strangled by the weight of my grief. When it was my turn to speak, my voice was a mere whisper, barely audible even in the hushed courtroom. I have always done my best for Lily. I love her more than anything, and all I've ever wanted was to make her happy. The judge looked at me, his expression unreadable and then scribbled some notes that felt like the final nails in the coffin of my parental rights. The gavel fell with a sound that echoed like a door slamming shut on my heart. Custody was granted to Mark, and with it, a clear message. I was not enough. Walking out of the courthouse, the sky was a brilliant blue, mocking me with its clarity. I felt anything but clear. Everything was a blur. The faces, the city, my future. But amid the chaos of my thoughts, a spark of defiance flickered to life. They thought I was done, that I would crumble, but I wouldn't give them the satisfaction. I turned to my old friend Sarah, who had come to support me at the trial. I'm going back to college, I declared, the words feeling like shards of glass in my mouth, sharp and dangerous. Sarah's eyes widened. Are you sure, Em? After everything, especially after everything I said, the resolve hardening inside me like cement. I need to do this for myself. I need to show them, and me, that I'm more than what they think. The journey back to college was a Herculean task. I scrimped and saved every dime, took on extra shifts at the bakery. The nights were long, filled with textbooks, and the soft hum of my old laptop, 
as I revisited lessons I had abandoned years ago. Social media was a constant reminder of the life I had lost. Pictures of Mark, Lily, and a woman with a too bright smile in luxurious settings filled my feed. They looked happy, untouched by the turmoil they had left in their wake. The sting of their apparent happiness fueled me, driving me to study with even more vigor. By the end of the semester, my grades were at the top of my class. The professors took notice, often using me as an example for younger students. See what determination looks like, they would say, pointing to my work. The recognition was bittersweet. With each accolade, I felt a mix of pride and sorrow. Pride for my achievements, sorrow for the reason behind my drive. But no matter how hard it was, I pushed forward, building a new life from the ashes of the old. Graduation day was a blur of pride and pomp. My name echoed in the auditorium as I walked across the stage, diploma in hand. My professors furnished me with glowing recommendations that opened doors I once thought permanently closed. I landed a job at a reputable financial firm, starting as a junior analyst. I immersed myself in work, my life becoming a cycle of reports, meetings, and endless learning. Within five years, I was leading my own department, a testament to the relentless nights and skipped social outings. Life wasn't just about work, though. I bought a sleek new car, one that hummed under my touch and gleamed under the city lights. My apartment, once a cramped space filled with reminders of a painful past, was traded in for a modern, spacious loft in a vibrant part of the city. I revamped my wardrobe, my new clothes sharp and empowering, each piece a reflection of the new me. I even changed my hairstyle, opting for a chick cut that framed my face with confidence. Then one day, as I scrolled through job listings to see what the market was offering, I froze. There in bold letters was an opening for a department head at a familiar company. It was Mark's company. The irony wasn't lost on me. A wicked part of me buzzed with the thrill of the potential drama. I applied, driven by the desire to restore justice. The interview was a series of rapid-fire questions, my answers sharp and sure. The panel was impressed, and by the end of the week, I had the job. The head of the company, Mr. Clarkson, introduced me to my new team. Team, this is Emma. She'll be taking over as your new department head. I expect everyone to give her your full cooperation. The room was a mix of curious and welcoming faces, but one stood out, his expression unrateable. Mark. His shock was palpable, his eyes widening as he took in my transformation from the woman he once discarded to the boss he now had to answer to. After the introduction, Mark lingered. His pride was obviously bruised. When we were alone with Mr. Clarkson, he couldn't hold back. Why her? I applied for this position. I have more experience with the company. Mr. Clarkson looked from Mark to me, his expression calm. Mark, while your familiarity with the company is appreciated, it's the broader expertise and strong leadership skills we need for this role. Emma brings a fresh perspective and a proven track record that you frankly haven't demonstrated. I suggest you learn from her. The words seemed to crush whatever pride Mark had left. He stormed out, slamming the door behind him with a force that echoed through the quiet office. I stood there, the ghost of a smile playing on my lips, not out of spite, but out of satisfaction. After the showdown at the office, Mark couldn't handle the new dynamics. Within weeks, he resigned, his departure quiet but the talk of the office. I heard through the corporate grapevine that he struggled to find a similar position elsewhere. Things spiraled for him, and soon the woman he was living with kicked him and Lily out, tired of his constant joblessness. They moved back in with Richard and Moran, but it wasn't the comfortable retreat Mark had hoped for. The luxuries Lily was accustomed to were no longer sustainable, and even his parents couldn't indulge her whims as they once had. 
Reality bit hard, and Lily found it difficult to adjust to their changed circumstances. One afternoon, there was a knock on my new apartment door. I opened it to find Lily standing there, her eyes roaming over the chic decor and the city view that stretched behind me. Wow, Mom, this place is amazing, she said, letting out a whistle. I guess I'll be staying here now. There was a sense of expectancy in the air as she spoke. For a minute, my heart ached from a range of emotions as I watched her. She was standing in my house, as like the decision to move in would erase all the years of abuse and neglect. Lily, starting over involves more than simply finding a new place to live. It's about admitting faults and making amends. You haven't shown regret for anything, even the things you've said and done, or the way you've treated me. Her expression lowered, and then, seemingly at the same moment, tears filled her eyes. Please accept my apology, Mom. Can't we simply put that out of our minds? I'd want to join you here. Although it was difficult to read the appeal in her eyes, the tears appeared to be more of a ploy than genuine regret. Lily, even though I adore you, you can't stay here only for practical reasons or as an escape from an awful situation. You must genuinely want to make apologies and be here for the right reasons. The tears stopped as fast as they had begun as she wiped her face. All right, I'll simply go if you don't want me here. My determination was demonstrated in the months that followed. Sarah informed me that Mark had turned to alcohol as a coping mechanism for his damaged ego and the life he had destroyed on his own. Maybe looking for the new beginning she had sought with me, Lily relocated to a different city. In the meantime, my career took off. Professionally, life was solid and rewarding, but the personal triumph was what made the newfound achievement more enjoyable. Tom and I first met at a seminar. The wounds from my first marriage were soothed by his compassion and understanding. Our same hobbies brought us together, and our friendship quickly developed into love. With a small group of close friends, we were married in a low-key ceremony. I knew I had found peace as I stood there with Tom exchanging vows. The future was a promise I was prepared to fulfill, and the past was in the past. 